Hey, this is Brent Jensen, and you're listening to No Sleep Till Sudbury, the show where we talk about the music that makes your skin vibrate. The show is brought to you by Pariah Pickups, quality handcrafted guitar pickups from Detroit. Check them out at pariahpickups.com. And folks, if you want to support the No Sleep Till Sudbury podcast on Patreon, you can gain access to all kinds of unreleased stuff from the show, outtakes, deleted material, personal photos, behind-the-scenes content, lots of fun stuff. Just go to patreon.com slash Brent Jensen Music for details. Hope to see you there. All right, today I want to talk about In Excess singer Michael Hutchins and the circumstances surrounding his unfortunate passing. Now, given the degree of his stardom and his age, there were bound to be multiple theories surrounding the nature of his death. And as is often the case in these situations, some of these theories are salacious and sensationalized. This is one of those stories that irked me somewhat because the most popular and widely believed theory, at least for a little while, was that Hutchins' death resulted from autoerotic asphyxiation, death by sexual misadventure. There are all kinds of theories involved, including a newer piece of the puzzle introduced years later involving previously undisclosed brain damage that Hutchins had suffered. Let's go through all of these pieces now not necessarily with the intention of solving the puzzle, per se, but instead to gain a clearer understanding of the basis and the merit of each of the pieces. To support the release of their album Elegantly Wasted in April of 1997, Michael Hutchinson in excess embarked on a world tour to support the new record. A few years before, Hutchinson had begun dating Paula Yates, They first met when she interviewed him for her UK music program, called The Tube, in 1985. Almost 10 years later, Yates would interview Hutchins again, this time for her morning entertainment, Big Breakfast Show. Around this time, the British tabloids began to speculate that the two were romantically linked, despite the fact that Yates was married to Boomtown Rats lead singer and Live Aid founder Bob Geldof. Yates would separate from Geldof in February 1995, and they would divorce the following year amidst a messy and very public custody battle over their children. A few months after their divorce, in July of 1996, Yates gave birth to Hutchins' daughter, whom they named Heavenly Hirani Tiger Lily Hutchins. Two months later, in September of 1996, Hutchins and Yates made different kinds of headlines when they were arrested for suspicion of drug possession. The family nanny had allegedly found opium concealed in a Smarties tube under their bed. This, of course, fanned the flames of the couple's child custody battle with Geldof, even though the charges were dropped based on a lack of evidence shortly after the arrest. In Excess's 1997 world tour would lead them back to their native Australia in November and December of that year. And while the tour had been progressing, Yates had planned to visit Hutchins with their daughter and the three children she'd had with Bob Geldof. But Geldof had prevented any visits through a number of legal actions that he had taken. On November 18, Hutchins checked into room 524 of the Ritz-Carlton Hotel in Double Bay, Sydney, Australia, under the name Mr. Murray River. On the morning of November 22, 1997, Hutchins, aged 37, was found dead in his hotel room. His former love interest, Kim Wilson, and her boyfriend were the last people to see Hutchins alive during their visit to his room the previous evening. During their investigation, police determined that Hutchins had spoken over the phone with both Geldof and Yates on the morning of his death after his guests had left. Both declined to offer their phone records, however. But in her statement on November 26, Paula Yates claimed that she had advised Hutchins that her custody hearing of her children had been adjourned until the following month, which would prevent Yates from bringing any of the children to visit Hutchins in Australia a trip that had been planned long in advance. Yates told police this news upset Hutchins to the degree that he told her, quote, I don't know how I'll live without seeing Tiger, unquote. Yates then informed police that Hutchins told her he was going to sort out the problem himself by calling Geldof to arrange for the visit to occur. 
Geldof acknowledged the subsequent phone call from Hutchins in his police statement, describing Hutchins as drunk and abusive, yelling threats at him over the course of their phone conversation. This statement was corroborated by an individual staying in the room next to room 524, who claimed he heard a male voice swearing loudly at around 5 a.m. It was assumed that this was the argument Hutchins was having with Geldof. There were other calls made by Hutchins following his exchange with Geldof. He left messages for those he couldn't reach, like his manager Martha Troop, his message to her claiming that he had had enough. At 9.54 a.m. on November 22nd, Hutchins was able to reach his former girlfriend, Michelle Bennett. In her statement, Bennett claimed Hutchins was very upset and crying, telling her he urgently needed to see her. When she arrived at his hotel room less than an hour later, she knocked on the door repeatedly, but there was no response. At 11.50 a.m., Hutchins's nude body was found by a hotel maid, reportedly discovered in a kneeling position facing the hotel room door. It appeared that he had used his snakeskin belt to tie a knot on the automatic door closure at the top of the door and hang himself. He had forced his head through the loop of the belt so hard that the buckle of the belt had broken. The coroner's post-mortem determination found a copious amount of alcohol in Hutchins' system, in addition to Prozac, cocaine, Valium, codeine. There was no suicide note to be found at the scene, and his death was officially reported by the New South Wales coroner to be a result of suicide by hanging. Now, in 2019, new information would come to light. Supermodel Helena Christensen, Hutchins' girlfriend in 1992, claimed that they had spent time together in Copenhagen during that year. On one of those evenings, following a lengthy drinking spree, Hutchins was drunkenly riding a bicycle home, down the middle of a street. He reportedly refused to move out of the way of a taxi driver, who became so angry that he actually got out of his cab and confronted Hutchins, punching him and knocking him down, where his head would hit the curb quite violently, knocking Hutchins unconscious. Christensen recalled that Hutchins was lying completely knocked out in the street, with blood seeping from his ear and his mouth. She thought that he may have even been dead. He would later wake up in a hospital confused and behaving aggressively, insisting on leaving and physically pushing medical staff away, refusing their care. The injury had apparently negatively impacted his senses of smell and taste, and after a two-week period of eventual recovery in a Danish hospital, Hutchins remained sequestered in his home for an entire month with Christensen, allegedly refusing food and vomiting blood, according to her. It was said that after that evening, Hutchins was never quite the same. His behavior continued to become more unpredictable and aggressive, and he seemed determined to put himself in dangerous, unfavorable situations. Friends say that his personality changed drastically from being a joyful, kind, thoughtful person to a darker individual, more prone to anger. His fellow band members were apparently shocked by the transition, remarking that he was no longer the Michael Hutchins that they knew. The new Michael Hutchins began taking a number of drugs to cope with the pain that he felt as a result of the injury. When the time came to begin recording the new In Excess album, the changes in Hutchins' personality remained. He behaved erratically during the sessions hosting huge parties at his home, rather than focusing on the responsibilities required of him during the recording of an album. Hutchins' behavior was enough of a concern to the other band members that they decided to change studios, moving to a remote, out-of-the-way facility on the Isle of Capri. Although he initially bought into the idea and actually had a say in selecting the specific studio the band would use, it wouldn't be long until Hutchins came to despise his isolation and he became disruptive. Band producer Mark Opitz shared a villa with the singer and was awoken regularly by Hutchins, who often took to destroying furniture on the upstairs floor of the villa, and this was only the beginning. Hutchins allegedly threatened to stab bassist Gary Beers with a knife during a heated argument. Fellow band member Tim Ferriss remarked that Hutchins was, quote, 
a very different human being. None of us felt like we really knew him, unquote. During one of the sessions, Hutchins was heavily intoxicated and became belligerent, voicing his displeasure with the track the band was recording, and shoved his microphone through the strings of Andrew Ferris's acoustic guitar. He insisted the band move in a darker, more grungy direction. There was a considerable amount of not just tension, but violence. Microphone stands flying around the studio, and tantrums taking place on a regular basis, according to the other members of InXS. The band ended up taking a month off for Christmas, and when they returned from the break, it was said that Hutchins' behavior had improved. But we still have this consideration now that Hutchins' personality may have been significantly altered by the head injury that he sustained in 1992, and speculation that it may have played some role in his death. At the time of his passing, very little was known about the dramatic personality changes that can occur as a result of brain injuries. But as more and more professional hockey players, football players, and boxers began to present with symptoms of a degenerative brain disease called chronic traumatic encephalopathy, or CTE, Research has linked the impact of concussions on impulse control and behavioral changes. Some people within Hutchins' inner circle, and even some of his family members, believe that this happened to him, and that it may have been a factor in his death. Other members of his family drew more extreme conclusions. Hutchins' brother, Rhett, has suggested that Michael could have been murdered by someone else. He issued a statement via his social media channels on what would have been Michael's 57th birthday. The statement read, quote, Only three things could have happened that day. Michael may have committed suicide. Michael may have passed due to lack of oxygen, due to sexual misadventure. Or Michael was killed. In the last 19 years, looking, searching, talking to people, I have found all three things to be plausible but I still don't have a solid answer, unquote. So, there's also that. Now, a short while after Hutchins' death, Polly Yates began making the rounds with the theory of a tragic autoerotic asphyxiation accident, claiming that Hutchins may not have taken his own life. She supported this claim by asserting that there was no suicide note left behind, no goodbye of any kind to his daughter. This touched off a massively popular rumor that Hutchins had independently attempted to deprive his brain of oxygen in the hope of heightening orgasm, but ended up killing himself in the bargain. Yates was vehement in her support of this theory, to the degree that she shouted the graphic details of the sex games that she and Hutchins played at detectives as they conversed in a restaurant shortly after she arrived in Australia following Hutchins' death. Detectives said later that Yates told them Hutchins would strangle her during sex. Although a number of individuals from Hutchins' inner circle of friends and former lovers would concur with these assertions, there was no evidence to support these claims, and the theory was ultimately rejected by authorities. In fact, in February 1998, New South Wales state coroner Derek Hand presented his findings via a very thorough report following an autopsy and inquest. The report officially asserted that Hutchins' death was suicide by hanging, while depressed and under the influence of alcohol and drugs, and notes that he was made aware of the alternative possibilities of death by sexual misadventure and murder, and claims that he is satisfied with his ruling of suicide. He then outlines the reasoning behind his decision based on the following points. Hutchins' conversation with Michelle Bennett the morning of his death, during which he was crying and distraught. Hutchins' conversation with his father the evening before, during which he seemed very pensive about the forthcoming decision in the child custody battle. A statement from Hutchins' mother, claiming that he was struggling with depression, and the fact that Hutchins was prescribed Prozac by two separate medical practitioners in London. Hand also weighed the statements of Kim Wilson and her boyfriend, who claimed that Hutchins wanted them to stay with him to offer support should the custody decision be unfavorable. The messages left with manager Martha Troop were also considered. The second one received at 9.50 a.m. B. 
being of particular concern due to the fact that Hutchins's delivery was very sluggish, like he was being affected by something. All of these points, coupled by the fact that large quantities of drugs and alcohol were found in his system, summarized Han's ruling in the report. Unequivocally, suicide by hanging. One of the more intriguing considerations in this case is an assertion beyond coroner Han's gathering of facts that when Michael Hutchins' personal diaries from the 80s were found, they were said to contain drawings of little stick figures with nooses around their necks. On November 27, 1997, Michael Hutchins' funeral took place at St. Andrew's Cathedral in Sydney. As in excess hit Never Tear Us Apart played, the pallbearers, consisting of the remaining members of Inexcess and Hutchins' brother, Rhett, carried the casket from the cathedral. Rhett would later write in his book, Total Excess, that on the day before the funeral, Paul Yates had placed a gram of heroin into Hutchins' pocket. Paul Yates herself would die not three years later, on September 17, 2000, of a heroin overdose. She was found in the presence of her then four-year-old daughter, Tiger Lily. She was 41. All right, that was kind of a grim ending. Let's lighten it up a little bit by going off and listening to some In Excess in memory of Michael Hodgins. I think I'm going to throw on something from Listen Like Thieves. This has been No Slip Till Subway with Brent Jensen. Thanks for listening. Until next time, folks. Take good care. Brent Jensen is the best-selling author of No Sleep Till Subbury, Leftover People, and All My Favorite People Are Broken. All titles available in stores and on Amazon Worldwide. <laughs>